welcome to everybody. I'm excited to see everyone here, all of our uh, concentrators and our um, thesis writers, our capstone, uh, senior capstone writers and, and thesis writers, We're really pleased to have everyone here, along with um, their friends and family, whoever has been able to join us. We're very excited. I'm uh, Sandy Zip. I am the director of the Urban Studies Program. Um, I'll be joined here by um, several, hopefully, faculty members in urban studies, and particularly my colleague, Rebecca Carter, uh, who's joint with uh, the anthropology department. So you'll be hearing from her in a moment as well. So I hope that everyone has their, um, whatever has their programs available to them and um, will be able to follow along at home. Uh, and I will um, be running the show here, just introducing first our two thesis writers um, who will uh, each talk for a few minutes. Um, I'll introduce our first thesis writer and Rebecca Carter will introduce our second and then we'll move into our capstone presentations which will be um, a few, uh, each, of, each of our seniors will, will talk about their capstone work as well. Um, unfortunately, due to the um, technical and time constraints today, we won't be able to um, take questions on these uh, talks, but um, if you do have comments you'd like to share in the chat, um, that'd be great. People I'm sure will be happy to see thoughts or comments, but we won't be able to, um, to answer those just because of the uh, timing constraints. First up today, um, we have our honors thesis candidates and our honors thesis presentation. And I'm gonna start by introducing um, the uh, first of ours, who's, who uh, present presenters, who is Jeremy Berman. Um, I worked with Jeremy on this thesis, Los Angeles and Shared Scooters, a Regulatory and Infrastructural Experiment. Um, and it's quite an accomplishment, very well delivered, both qualitative and quantitative analysis of the um, state of the, the scooter industry and its dilemmas around trying to solve uh, what in transportation studies and transportation practitioners know as the first mile, last mile conundrum. The problem of getting people from their homes to transit and from uh, transit back to their homes or from transit to work um, and vice versa, right? So this uh, problem that so many, uh, particularly in the United States, we have between connecting transit up to home and work. And uh, Jeremy's gonna talk about the way that uh, this dilemma manifests in the contemporary scooter market. So. Take it away, Jeremy. Hey, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for coming. Uh, can you all see everything? All good? Yes. Great, uh, so I'm Jeremy. I'm gonna be presenting about my thesis, Los Angeles and Shared Scooters, a regulatory and infrastructural experiment. Oops. Uh, so in 2009, the Texas Transportation Institute found Los Angeles to be one of the most congested areas in the United States and freeway speeds are projected to drop by another 16 miles per hour by 2040. Uh, moreover, air quality is the worst in the country and over 80% of LA residents are concerned about it. Solutions to these problems are guided by the city's 2016 shared use mobility plan, which aims to remove 100,000 private cars from the roads over five years by increasing access to shared mobility options. Uh, shared electric scooters emerged in 2017 and appear to be the perfect addition to the LA transportation ecosystem. Rapid adoption rates, as you can see here, suggested that they are a popular mode and perhaps an alternative to cars for short trips. They're also fully electric, so they should be good for the environment. And survey data suggested that share, shared scooters would have better usage among women and low income folks, demographics where shared bikes had fallen short. Crucially for this thesis, uh, scooters were advertised as solutions to the first mile, last mile problem that Professor Zip mentioned, uh, or they would provide increased access to and from public transportation. Um, however, benefits for the city have not really materialized. Uh, scooter distribution, so distributions of the whole scooter fleet uh, that favor city goals, like not overcrowding sidewalks, encouraging first mile, last mile transportation, or encouraging equitable access, do not necessarily align with corporate goals, maximizing profit. Uh, after its scooter pilot program, Los Angeles is imposing heftier regulations to ensure favorable scooter distributions. However, scooter companies are already losing a lot of money. Lime alone lost over 300 million in 2019. This is because the scooter unit economics, as you can see here, are unfavorable. The cost of each trip is really high, 
and all of the projected improvements will take years to materialize if they materialize at all. This leads to a conflict. Los Angeles is trying to create favorable distributions of scooters for their goals through regulations and incentives, and scooter companies want to concentrate scooters in high profit areas to minimize their short term losses. Um, my focus is on how to make scooters more useful for first mile last mile trips, particularly with respect to meeting commute demand. Uh, so we can see the extent to which scooters lag behind station based bike share on a national level in terms of meeting commute demand. Uh, they closely follow the pattern we see for casual station based bike share users as opposed to the annual subscribers and survey data supports the fact that scooters are disproportionately viewed as recreational vehicles compared to their stationed bike share counterparts. In Los Angeles, these trends hold. So you can see the percentage, the percentage of trip, start, trip starts and trip ends within an 100 meter radius of a transit station in LA are very low uh, uniformly across disadvantaged communities, DACs or not DACs. Uh, so Minneapolis offered an interesting case study for how infrastructure could be used to encourage first mile, last mile trips or mobility hubs. Uh, so mobility hubs are a type of infrastructure that brings together shared transportation options at public transit stations. Um, so we had seen in Los Angeles that infrastructure like bike lanes could change the routes people take. Uh, they built one bike lane. Um, there are four parallel streets. They built a bike lane on one of them and people tended to take a route that went down the street with the bike lane. Uh, with mobility hubs, it's asking a different question. Can this new type of infrastructure change the types of trips that people take altogether? So if we look at uh, the Minneapolis hubs, uh, just to note, I'm comparing data from September 2018 and September 2019 to understand the impact of the 2019 hubs. Uh, they were installed in the summer of 2019. So these 2019 hubs in green uh, have no clear pattern in terms of the population densities or incomes in their areas. Um, it is important to note that the 2020 hubs uh, will seem to target more low income areas. Uh, however, the 2019 hubs are spread out, circling downtown Minneapolis, uh, where all the transit routes converge with roughly a two mile radius. And crucially, they're not placed in areas with high volumes of scooter trips. Lastly, I wanna note that I define these regions of interest based on the typical scooter trip distance of a mile and a half. Um, so areas where it would be feasible to travel to a hub via scooter. Um, so if we look at the temporal um, trip patterns, uh, the key finding uh, is that at transit stations where mobility hubs were built, uh, first mile, last mile trips increased at three times the rate that total trips increased. Um, however, the temporal distribution um, of these trips raises new questions. Namely, why are scooters not used for morning commutes? Um, so uh, we can see that the total trips, uh, this is all trips in the city on the left here, uh, increases faster than first mile, last mile trips. Here we see um, outflow is trips leaving from a mobility hub, inflow is trips going into a mobility hub. Uh, and we can see that tr total trips is increasing faster than these first mile, last mile trips during the morning, uh, which means that we're straying even further from the bimodal distribution that we see with the station-based bike share. Uh, my original hypothesis was that mobility hubs would improve the perceived reliability of scooters, making them operate in a similar way to the docked bike share, uh, but this suggests otherwise. Um, the key is to look at the deployment patterns. Um, so what's happening here is that the mobility hubs are changing the geography of scooter demand within the regions of interest. So hubs account for 8% of the demand in the regions of interest and are less than 1% of the area. Accordingly, it's convenient for scooter companies to deploy or drop off their scooters uh, at the hubs. And we can tell that the scooters are being deployed there uh, because of the constant disparity between outflow trips and inflow trips. Um, however, the constant rate of first mile, last mile trips seen throughout the day on the right here, um, suggests that there could potentially be a market uh, for these morning commute trips, uh, first mile, last mile trips. Um, but the key here is that low deployment of scooters in the interest regions uh, in the mornings, it's down at like 5%, um, makes that less likely to occur. Uh, whereas the high deployment in the interest re regions in the evenings, up to 15% of the total fleet 
uh, makes that much easier to happen. And this trend carries over from 2018 to 2019, barring some noise in the morning hours of 2018. So the takeaways are that mobility hubs are an effective tool for encouraging first mile, last mile trips. And they do so by providing a convenient venue for scooter companies to deploy scooters within the regions of interest. Uh, however, if first mile, last mile trips are a function of scooter deployment, cities are relying on support from scooter companies, which deploy scooters based on historical demand patterns. Uh, and since scooter demand in the regions of interest has historically been low in the mornings and high in the evenings, scooter companies stick with this temporal deployment pattern. Um, so one way to correct for this would be with dynamic incentives that can push scooter companies to alter their fleet distributions to meet spatial and temporal scooter city goals, uh, rather than the current incentives, which only focus on the spatial component. Um, thank you all for coming, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Rebecca Carter, now for her introduction of Alicia Mies. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Alicia Mies, a senior concentrator in urban studies who is graduating with honors. It has been a privilege to witness Alicia's scholarly growth over the last four years. From the first year seminar she took with me in the fall of 2017 to the engaged scholars classes on art, youth, and the promised city in the spring of 2018, and the first installment of the Just City series in the spring of 2020, focused on juvenile justice reform and abolition. All of this work has beautifully come together in her honors thesis titled The Just City in Crisis, How Connecticut's Child Welfare Agency Adapted to COVID-19, for which I was delighted to serve as an advisor. It demonstrates in particular an expertise in archival research and ethnographic fieldwork. I'm really proud now to introduce to you all Alicia Mies. Thank you so much for that. Really nice introduction, Professor Carter. Uh, my name is Alicia and my thesis is called The Just City in Crisis, How Connecticut's Child Welfare Agency Adapted to COVID-19. Um, so there's so many moving parts to my thesis and I'm certainly not gonna get to everything. So I thought I'd just ground it with some context. Um, last summer, I interned at a private family law firm in Torrington, Connecticut over Zoom with attorney Philip Walker, who is a Brown alum. Um, the two pictures show Torrington, Connecticut. It's a micropolitan statistical area with 34,000 people. And um, during my internship, I interacted with and studied Connecticut's Child Welfare Agency, the Department of Children and Families, or DCF. And during my internship, uh, DCF prohibited in-person visitation between parents who lost custody of their children and children. And that was all um, because of COVID. So this, uh, my research really led me to wonder how justice works in urban institu institutions during emergency situations like a pandemic. And I thought back to the Just City framework, which I think um, some of you might have encountered or studied at Brown. Um, Susan Feinstein, urban scholar, created this idea of the Just City in her 2010 book, The Just City, in which she attempts to create a theory of justice that can help urban planners and bureaucrats to make more equitable decisions. And another urban scholar, Miriam Williams, builds on this idea of the Just City and uh, she creates her own concept called the careful justice in, or careful justice or an ethic of care um, to guide urban institutions and processes. And um, reading all this material led me to the research question, can a just city be achieved in a crisis like the pandemic? Sorry about um, the chunk of text, but it's a very clear representation of my argument, so I'll read it out loud. Um, in order to answer this question, I needed to examine how DCF operated pre-pandemic, how adapted to COVID, and how it has impacted the parents and children in its care. The investigation revealed that DCF has always been an expansive bureaucratic agency with the power to separate children from their parents and that because of this enormous capability for years many parents have experienced have expressed a feeling of unfairness and lack of care when interacting with DCF. After the pandemic broke out the state of Connecticut and DCF wielded executive power and prohibited parents and children from seeing each other in person demonstrating how DCF is a state organization with the overwhelming power to block children from seeing their parents indefinitely in an emergency. Ultimately, the pandemic exacerbated DCF's structural issues and made clear the true jurisdiction and power imbalance of Connecticut's child welfare system. 
So before we get into my evidence analysis, I'll briefly explain my methods. Uh, my research began in my in internship where I zoomed a lot. Um, and a lot of this was observational research with sitting in on um, a ton of different administrative meetings. I did case study research and I particularly used a legal database called LexisNexis to do a lot of this case study research. Um, when I came back to, to campus, I knew that I wanted to formally conduct interviews with parents who had experienced DCF during the pandemic. So I had to go through the Institutional Review Board um, I'm not sure if it was because of the pandemic, but uh, the process was, it, it felt a bit um, less communicative and um, more confusing than maybe in a typical year. I applied for IRB approval in November and I received approval in January, which was a bit later than I anticipated, but I still was able to reach out to someone because of the IRB process. And lastly, I did general research. I used JSTOR and other online resources and databases to find out about, um, find out more about urban theory, the history of Torrington, Connecticut, DCF, and the child welfare system in general. Um, through my research, I found that DCF is a very bureaucratic agency. Um, this is a very small example of this, but the typical chain of command in one of DCF's eight area offices is program director to program supervisor to social work supervisor to regional office social worker to foster and adoptive social unit social worker to recruiting social worker to licensing social worker to matching social worker to finally family specialist slash support social worker. And I think that chain of demand command really encapsulates the sort of stratified and hierarchical nature of um, DCF. On top of that, DCF has a confusing top-down procedure. Again, this is just a small example of this, but uh, parents who um, are clients of DCF must attend dozens of meetings and programs in order to get custody of their children back. Some of these meetings include administrative case reviews, case status conferences, permanency plan hearings, check-ins with social workers, um, and this doesn't even include the formal hearings that parents must go to through um, the family courts or the sometimes six or seven programs that they must complete in order to prove that they um, want custody of their children back. Um, when I got IRB approval, I created a poster to recruit parents involved in DCF during the pandemic. Betty, whose name has been changed for privacy reasons, did not experience DCF during COVID, but she still reached out and we had a really, really insightful conversation where she um, sort of touched on DCF's bureaucracy and um, the nature of its procedure. So in 2019, Betty was prescribed a medication for a facial tic caused by stress. Uh, this medication caused a really bad reaction to her. It, it made her really drowsy. Um, but she one night she took the medication like she was prescribed and she fell asleep. She woke back up. And um, on a usual night, she had trouble sleeping. So she usually took melatonin. So she that night she reached for what she thought was melatonin, but it ended up being more of the prescribed medication that caused a really bad reaction in her. And so she took too much of this medication. Um, the next morning, she did not wake up and she wasn't able to take her two children to school. Um, understandably, her two children started freaking out and they called an ambulance. And um, when Betty woke up, she was in the hospital and uh, DCF had taken her two children out of her custody and put them into the custody of her uh, what she calls adversarial ex-husband. Um, and uh, she believes that DCF took custody of her children because she had previous cases with DCF because she had uh, previously um, had alcohol abuse disorder or she was in recovery for years at that point. And because she thought that they thought that she tried to commit suicide. So um, on DCF's investigation, she said, Nobody was communicating with me. Everyone was formulating their own thoughts, pulling files, talking to people other than me. It was awful. During the process, there is no navigating the system. You don't have control. You have no say. One week after I was discharged from the hospital, I had a meeting at DCF, but it literally was an exercise in futility in the sense that it gave me a time, a room, a space to be able to express myself without anybody listening. By that time, it was already done. The decision was made to keep my file open. I lost my children. And I think that quote really encapsulates um, sort of the feeling of powerlessness that she had during the process and um, the lack of recourse that she had as well. Um, and that is particularly because 
DCF is so bureaucratic and she had no point person to talk to. And um, because they made these like absolute top down decisions regarding her case without properly hearing and, and listening to her side of the story. I'm gonna skip the second quote just because I feel like I have no time. But um, what really stuck out to me was Betty was a model uh, DCF client. She did everything exactly how she was supposed to do. Um, and by the end of her case, she had to sign an acknowledgement of neg negligence uh, that basically said that she intended to neglect her children. And she said, I felt I could not do that because I did not intend to be negligent. I did not intend to harm my children by not waking up that day. I did not intend to take my life. And so I cannot put pen to paper and there was a delay in the process because I need to sit with it. So again, I think um, that really shows the sort of coercive top-down procedure that um, an institution like DCF wields in order to um, just continue on with its process. Uh, transitioning back to DCF, and I know I'm, I'm going over time, but uh, in response to COVID, DCF instituted a strict prohibition of in-person visitation between parents and children. Um, after four months of that strict prohibition, in June, DCF Commissioner Vanessa Durantes created a triage review protocol that delineated who gets in-person visitation, who doesn't. Um, cases where reunification ex was expected within the next three months, cases with infants zero to six months of age, and um, cases where there were unresolved barriers to in-person visitations were the only cases allowed to be considered for in-person visitation. And this protocol felt arbitrary and a breach of power to many lawyers and advocates in Connecticut, particularly because psychological research for decades shows that children need in-person time with their guardians. They need to maintain some sense of attachment with um, their parents or guardian in order to feel connected to both them and the world. And so most importantly, this time period of attachment is not limited to infancy. It's not limited to zero to six months of age, um, but it can extend up to six years. So that was um, a bit of an arbitrary decision on DCF's part. Also, a lot of sociological research shows that in-person visitation is vital to family reunification. So essentially, um, DCF structural issues before the pandemic, as evidenced by Betty stories, were exacerbated and expanded during the pandemic. Um, in response to COVID, DCF made these top-down absolute decisions where um, that apply to every family, um, where they didn't really have recourse or uh, have any say in, in these decisions at all. And uh, they these decisions could have had huge impacts on the parent-child bond and the prospects of reunification. So going back to the initial research question, um, I concluded that Susan Feinstein's Just City framework feels a bit ill-fitted for the child welfare system because it's so focused on planning principles, whereas um, William's concept of the careful justice in the city or, or an ethic of care um, guiding the city more readily takes into account the messy interpersonal relationships and families and between clients and social workers. So ultimately, I conclude that a just city can only be possible in, in crisis if an ethic of care is properly integrated into our urban institutions. And I think this is so important because COVID is absolutely not the last emergency or crisis that this country is going to see. I mean, especially with the threat of climate change on the horizon. And I think it's really important for our urban institutions to really think about how they're taking care of our people, especially, you know, people who are usually part of marginalized populations, usually poor, usually black or brown. And I think um, an ethic of care really does need to guide um, our world in the future. <laughs> so thank you to Professor Carter, to Julie Plott, my second reader, and to the Urban Studies Program. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much. Thank you to Jeremy and to Alicia and to Professor Carter for that. Um, we want to uh, give you a sense, those of you who are watching, the difference and the two levels of uh, research that our uh, sort of culminating research that our students are doing. Um, so you've, you've heard here from Alicia and Jeremy about uh, their year-long um, in-depth uh, single focus research projects, but we also have the um, capstone uh, as an experience that um, all of our seniors undertake to, to take on original research and original investigation into a topic in urban studies. And so the capstone is um, 
a bit of a moving target. So we have some flexibility as to how many of our students take it on. Uh, most of the projects that you'll be hearing today are either uh, a, a longer paper that students have taken on in one of their senior or junior seminars, one of their big um, culminating seminars, or it is uh, the fruits of an independent study project. And so what you'll be hearing here is the, uh, is the, the fruits of individual research, but also some, um, some thinking from these students about how these research projects or these topics help them to think about their urban studies concentration as a whole. Our urban studies uh, major in concentration is one in which students are bringing a lot of different uh, ideas and a lot of di different disciplines together. As you could see from Alicia and Jeremy's uh, perspective, uh, presentations, they are, um, all of our students are, are trained in several different kinds of methodologies across their time here um, and bring those together to think about uh, city issues um, and city uh, urbanization and urban issues. And so um, you'll see some of that also in these capstones, right? And you'll be getting a sense from our capstone presenters about how they think about uh, how this research uh, helped them to think about being an urban studies concentrator and their studies here at their, in their time at Brown. So with that, let's get started. We're going in alphabetical order. Um, all I'll be doing is uh, calling out folks' name and uh, their title and hoping that they're able to uh, pop up right on the screen, share their slides and, and go away. And we'll just keep coming back to me in between for the quick handoff. So let's get started. First, we have Samaria Alpern with Stigma in the City, the impact of criminal legal system involvement on individual and community well-being. Hi everyone and congratulations to Alicia and Jeremy on your theses, those were amazing. Um, so yeah, as professors have just mentioned, my name is Samaria and my capstone project is called Stigma in the City, the impact of criminal legal system involvement on individual and community well-being. Um, so some answers that I've aimed to explore in my urban studies education include what is the impact of criminal legal system involvement on people living in cities? How does the criminal legal system intersect with housing, education, and healthcare systems in cities? And how can we address these issues as a community? Um, and I'm not going to answer all of those right now, but that's just a little bit of a background on what I'm interested in. Um, so a few years ago, I took a course called Housing Justice with Professor Bull. Um, and um, in that project, in that course, I worked with Megan Smith, a PhD candidate at Boston University, as well as another group of students in the class on a project that she was working on called Locked Out. Um, and we used an online tool um, that Megan developed to analyze the use of criminal credit and landlord history in Rhode Island public housing and federally subsidized housing tenant selection plans. Um, and this really gave me more insight into the way that stigmatization of people with criminal records plays out um, in the housing system. So for example, there are mandatory reasons to deny someone based on a certain type of criminal history that they may have, but um, housing providers can also use um, discretionary denial in order to not deny people for lower level crimes like misdemeanors, shoplifting, things as small as that. Um, and there's also discouraging language used in tenant selection plans and applications, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and then finally, there's laws that um, have been developed throughout the past few decades, especially during the war on drugs and the war on crime that pressure landlords to control crime within their housing facilities um, and make them liable for um, potential harms that happen within their um, properties. So just an example of the discouraging language that we found. Um, one question that we asked using the tool was, does the plan use the word arrest? And it's actually illegal to discriminate um, and federally subsidized housing based on someone's arrest history. But we found that nearly 20% of the plans use the word arrest um, in asking people about their history. So even though they weren't allowed to discriminate based on this, that language is still there. So you can imagine how someone with an arrest history might be discouraged from even applying in the first place if they think that they're gonna be rejected as a result of that. Um, and then I just wanna quickly contextualize this um, on individual community and well-being and how this um, housing discrimination intersects with other areas. Um, so, um, for example, if you have a certain type of criminal history, um, you will be ineligible for student loans, making it hard to um, ensure uh, financial stability for yourself and obtain housing. Um, next, there are health impacts of being involved in the criminal justice system, including higher prevalence of HIV, substance use disorder, mental health conditions, and other chronic mental health conditions. Um, that are more um, common among incarcerated populations. And then finally, another way um, that we can look at this intersection is the impact on families. So um, criminal legal system involvement has a direct impact that we can see, for example, 
um, family separation due to parental incarceration and subsequent loss of parental rights, but there are also um, indirect impacts that come from the intersections of these systems, for example, um, even if, if a parent doesn't directly lose their rights because of incarceration, a conviction or even an arrest can lead to housing insecurity for the reasons we talked about before and others that I won't get into um, that can then lead to child protective services involvement and then loss of parental rights. So as you can see, all these are really intersecting and I'm not gonna propose any solutions, but just a closing quote I wanna end with is from Miriam Kaba, an organizer and prison abolitionist, everything worthwhile is done with other people. So that's just something to keep in mind moving forward. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Samaria, especially for that final quote, which was important to remind us of in these times, right? So up next, we have Maddie Aronson with Reaching New Heights, Salesforce Tower and the Rise of San Francisco. Take it away, Maddie. My name is Maddie Aronson, and today I'm going to be briefly discussing the Salesforce Tower and the development of the Trans Bay District in San Francisco. So Throughout the past few decades, San Francisco has really changed drastically, uh, shifting from you know, being the center of counterculture in the 60s and 70s to now being known as the home of the tech industry. Excuse me. Um, I think this image here really showcases just how significant the industry's presence is in this area of the city in particular, which is just right outside the heart of downtown. Um, now my paper homes in on the Trans Bay District, which is not this whole area, but it's kind of this, this part right in the middle. Um, it's centered around a massive transit center as well as the Salesforce Tower, which in a little arrow too. Now in the 80s, there was a lot of pushback against major building developments in downtown, uh, particularly in the area north of Market Street. So that's Market Street right there. Uh, people wanted to prevent what they called the Manhattanization of San Francisco. Um, first with the dot-com boom and then the growth of Silicon Valley in the 90s and early 2000s, the city decided to lift some of their, their strict zoning laws and encourage more activity in this area south of Market Street. So this is where the Trans Bay Redevelopment Project comes into play. So after a lot of back and forth in 2006, they hired the Pelly Clark Pelly architecture firm to design both the new transit center, which is this kind of bubbly looking one. Um, and here's an aerial view. They've got a beautiful uh, rooftop park, um, as well as the towers. So they're separate buildings, but they're very much connected. Um, both buildings were also steeped in controversy for a number of reasons, but this tower in particular faced a lot of pushback from the community, mostly due to its height. Uh, so standing at 1,070 feet tall, it is the tallest building west of the Mississippi. Uh, as you can see here, it didn't even try to blend in with the existing skyline. Um, now, big changes like this one are bound to upset people that want their, their beloved city to exist solely in a vacuum and never change. Uh, but in many ways, I think it's a really good marker of this era in the city's history. It serves as a physical reminder of the disruption that the industry brought, but also showcases its innovation and growth. Um, now with the pandemic and the continuation of work from home policies at Salesforce and other companies, uh, the tower is just one of the many skyscrapers that is sitting almost entirely vacant right now and probably will be for the foreseeable future. Um, and I, for one, am very curious whether COVID is going to be something that defines a, a new era um, and how policies like these are going to affect urban development in San Francisco, but also cities throughout the world. So time will only tell uh, what happens there but yeah i think i think it'll be something to look out for in the in the next couple of years so uh thank you uh thank you professor azar i think you're on here too this is a paper for his class downtown development um so yeah that's all i've got thanks everyone thanks maddie that's great, right? So many important questions today about how we've um, subsidized all this office construction all of a sudden sitting empty, as you say, what will happen in the future? It really kind of asks us big questions about what we should be subsidizing in cities, right, in these days. Thanks so much, Maddie. Next up, we would have had Siobhan Brennan, but she couldn't be with us today um, at the last minute, but she wrote her capstone on activism and the subway, visions of a just city. So after Siobhan, we have Christopher Chia 
Star City San Jose, Rising Star or False Ray of Hope? Take it away, Chris. I also did this based on uh, Professor Aza's downtown development cost. Um, and I thought it encapsulated one of my favorite parts about urban studies, which is that when you keep the city constant, you really get to see the push and pull between the private and public sector. And um, Star City San Jose to me was one of the, it was almost a textbook perfect example of uh, you know that tripartite urban planning model where you have to balance environmental, economic, and social interest. Um, and I say textbook example, but I think you know, in the contemporary American context, for better or for worse, the public has become uh, a force in urban planning. And so this was a nice throwback to the to those old iron triangle days, um, but one where I argue the public actually benefited. So um, basically, this project was uh, it was a new thing back then where uh, these private developers decided to do basically a dorm dorm style living for adults. Um, nowadays, actually, you can find it in every global city where rents are high. Uh, but what I particularly liked was how smooth um, this approval process was. So it, it was new at that time, um, and the city planners essentially decided to rezone this parcel of land so that the private developer could uh, could build this co-living complex. And despite there being multiple opportunities for the public to come in and challenge uh, this rezoning process, they did not. Uh, and you know this this rezoning got passed extremely quickly. So I thought that was notable, uh, really notable, especially given what's been happening in Providence with the Fane Tower. Um, and, and I wanted to, to, to take a step back and reflect on that. I, I think it's nice uh, to see an example where an urban planning institution or, or an American bureaucratic institution is functioning well, especially given the discourse nowadays. Um, and, and it gives me some hope you know, that, that maybe there are, there are private developers that are willing to balance profit with the public interest and there are urban planners who can adjust their long-term plans uh, to suit the public interest with, short, with some short-term flexibility. So that the really elegant byplay where between the push and pull of the public and private sector, you get you know th this really dynamic project. That's what I really like about this project. It's nice to see a co-living, a co-working, a co-living co facility going uh, into, into building really well in a city like that. It's great. All right, next up is uh, Yuni Cho. Uh, with Power of Ornamentation in Shaping Culture Identity. So hi, I'm Yuni. I'm a fifth year dual degree student graduating this year. And over the past years, um, as a dual degree student at Brown University and Rhode Island School of Design, I was part of a rigorous program in a diverse academic community for five years, actively exploring the creative intersection of art, design, and urban theories. And working in different cultures and languages, I learned new ways to think, process, and really communicate information. And being in the urban studies department at Brown in combination with my degree in interior architecture at RISD allowed me to develop a strong interest in the history of ornament and pattern, which developed into my five year long investigation on the power of ornamentation in shaping cultural history. And today, as part of my capstone presentation, I would like to share a couple pages from my final book that I recently finished through an independent study with Professor Dietrich Neumann um, end of last year. And this project is about expanding the logic of ornamentation by asserting that the patterns of city fabric and urban planning can be viewed as ornaments, evoking how the space was, could be, or should be. And as the situation as mapping practice indicates, I believe that ornament now can exist in the larger urban scale as a symbolic means to indicate the political and functional usage of the space. And through this new way of viewing ornamentation, my project describes mapping as an ornamentation practice, as a language of communication, and as a way of thinking about non-neutrality of contemporary space. And in a way, I really wanted my documentation of thought process as well as reading notes to become an ornament in itself. And this is why all my research stems from travel sketchbooks and is composed of entirely handwritten and hand-drawn pages without the help from digital technology. And I truly believe that this book is a culmination of my experience as an urban studies concentrator, which shows how I think, process, and make things as an urban designer. And that's the end. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Uni. That's great. So if people want to see more of Uni's uh, ornament uh, project, uh, excerpts from it are going to be in our uh, urban journal, which will be 
um, published in, I don't know, a week or two, somewhere close, maybe a week, week and a half. We're not quite sure yet exactly when we'll have it back from the printer, but it'll be out there soon, available for all of you and for um, all the contributors. And Uni's artwork also graces the back cover of the Urban Journal. So look forward to that um, coming up before our senior celebration um, on the 28th. Next up is Yap De Yong, combating the uh, consequences of COVID on educational inequity in Southeast Amsterdam. Yap, go ahead. Hello, everybody. My name is Yap De Jong. Uh, for those who don't know me, um, I am from Amsterdam. I'm an uh, urban study concentrator like you are, and I also do architecture. Um, my architecture courses were mostly at RISD. Um, and during my time over the past four years, I've seen myself constantly return to uh, a neighborhood that's really close to where I live and really interesting to me. It's the southeastern neighborhood of Amsterdam. It's quite detached from the city. It's really well planned out. It's basically, I have a little video that shows you sort of where it is. It's like, <laughs> this is focusing in on a school that's there, a school that I'll be talking more about. But here you can see like Amsterdam city center is here and this is quite far out. And if you wanna get there, you need either public transportation or a car. But in Amsterdam, we like to bike and it's just quite, just a little too far to bike. Um, and that's a shame because you would, it has been designed so that you'd have everything in that neighborhood that you need so that you don't have to leave it. But then my um, former teacher in high school who teaches the classics, Latin and Greek, he was like, yeah, there's no school in this neighborhood that teaches this. And that's the highest level of uh, higher, higher education. And it should be accessible to everybody. So he started off a new uh, program at this school. This school used to be the worst in the city. And together with my old geography teacher, they completely revamped it and they changed the name, they added this program because there's 30,000 kids in this neighborhood and they need this program to be accessible because if they don't have it in their own neighborhood, then they would have to go either to one of these red spots, which are at least 45 minutes away, which is just too far for Amsterdam standards. Um, yeah. so. To, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this neighborhood. It's called the Belmer Mere. This is a picture of when it was just uh, built in the seventies. As you can see, it's like in a honeycomb pattern, which was uh, thought to be very safe. So you could always look over the corners and also into the green space in the middle. On the left here, you can see the, the Metro rail going through the city and it was quite utopian, but in reality, it was a bit of a failure at first. A uh, lot of empty houses, a lot of crime, and now it's really on the rise. And that's um, fascinating to me. I've been, I've, I've written papers about this in different classes. And now in my Just City course with Professor Carter, I've been focusing on the COVID uh, pandemic that is hitting the educational system and especially the kids who are already um, in a difficult situation. So that's why I thought to reach out to my former teacher who you can see here on the right, Kurano Bichiman, who is uh, like really promoting belonging, emancipation and accessibility to this highest level of education. And we came up with um, a volunteering uh, network project where all kinds of former students of his um, yeah, volunteer to, to give tutoring or supervision of homework classes to uh, the kids of this neighborhood who need it. So yeah, that's my capstone. Thank you. Thanks, Yap. That's great. I am um, living proof that it's actually possible to ride a bike from Amsterdam City Central to Bijlmer, having done it before with another urban historian a few years ago when I was sitting there. So it, 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 it was a long ride though, right? <laughs> You know, this green dotted line is what I used to write. Yeah. And that's like 20, 25 minutes. Yep. That was so this blue line would be your trip. That's yep. going to take a while, but it's definitely possible. We went on and on. Yeah, we did. All right. Thank you so much, Yap. 
Next up is Ilana Emanuel, Commemoration in Berlin, Germany. Take it away, Ilana. This is an excerpt from a paper I wrote last year for a class called Berlin, the Global Metropolis with Professor Galor. The Berlin Wall is the central monument of the Cold War that lasted from 1945 until 1989. The Iron Curtain, as it was called, physically blockaded the freedom of East Germany. By the end of the war, the wall was 96 miles long, made of complete concrete and equipped with guards and watchtowers. In the three decades since the fall of the wall, there has been a lively debate surrounding how it should be remembered. Firstly, should the wall be remembered at all? When the Cold War ended and the wall fell in 1989, Berliners and the international community were eager to get rid of remnants of the divisive symbol of communism. In 1992, the Berlin Senate passed a critical reconstruction plan with the goal of erasing any memory of the wall through building. However, as time passed, discussion of how the wall and the war should be remembered naturally arose. The effort to memorialize the wall was taken over by the Berlin Senate in 2004. Regardless of memorialization, the East Berlin-West Berlin divide is prominent in people's lives today through the social, economic, and political barriers that have yet to be broken. Given that the effort for unification feels incomplete to this day, the memorialization of the Berlin Wall prompts controversial debate throughout the city, all reflected in the three prominent memorials developed by the Berlin Senate. The first of these three memorials is Checkpoint Charlie, the famous border crossing and primary entrance to East Berlin. Throughout the 90s, the lack of government organized efforts to memorialize led this site to become commercialized. The Berlin Senate tried to combat this by adding a museum to the site. Nonetheless, the area raises controversy because its narrative is driven by businesses and profits from tourism, risking authenticity. The second primary memorial is Bernauer Strauss. This memorial is centered around a 70 meter stretch of the most notorious and tragic part of the wall, inviting debate about a psychological trauma as people have to walk past this every day. Another point of contention with the memorial was the viewing platforms and the proximity viewers had to the wall. Such experience at the wall is void of the experience of East Berliners who were not allowed near. The third main memorial is the East Side Gallery, a mile long wall turned into a gallery of over 100 murals by international artists. The East Side Gallery reflects a common perception of the Berlin Wall, a site from the West where the wall was treated as a canvas. This creates conflict because the purpose was the opposite of free expression. It was a barrier. For East Berliners, the wall was a distant, guarded, dangerous concrete slab. The Berlin Wall was standing a mere 30 years ago. This fuels the debate over preservation today because the message conveyed and the emotions evoked are personal. Concurrently, the government is tasked with preserving authenticity while also trying to capitalize on a booming intrigue from tourists. This deep and personal understanding of what persisted during the Cold War clashing with the government's desire to cater to the tourism industry evidently creates points of contention in the debate over how best to preserve and memorialize the Cold War and the Berlin Wall in particular. Um, a really great summation of the conflicts between commerce, art, and history that hover over so much of Berlin's life. Thank you so much. All right, next up we have Annalise Ernst. Illinois court fines and fees, a fine line between accountability and oppression. Today I'm gonna to be speaking briefly about my capstone titled Illinois court, court fines and fees, a fine line between accountability and oppression which was a study of Cook County, Illinois. And I also like to say that this capstone was um, done in the senior sociology seminar. Um, and it was a group's capstone project that I was a part of. Um, so for a little bit of background, um, the project was undertaken um, um, out, out of a request from the Chicago Appleseed Center for Fair Courts. Um, and the center is an organization that seeks anti-racist solutions to systemic injustices. Um, surrounding um, investigating the Criminal and Traffic Assessment Act, which is an act that streamlines, standardizes, and reduces court fees in order to facilitate a sliding scale fee waiver for defendants who can't afford to pay. Um, so basically investigating this recent act that is temporary um, and its effectiveness in actually um, being utilized to um, reduce or eliminate fees, court fines and fees for predominantly um, low income um, defendants of color. Um, and so the task were to review the most recent literature on the impact of court fines and fees, um, conduct interviews with various stakeholders, and to construct policy recommendations um, based on these findings. So interview findings, um, we conducted interviews with um, several public defenders in um, Cook County, um, which is the Chicago area. 
Um, and our findings from that were that public defenders very frequently utilize these waivers for their clients, um, and they emphasize that, of course, that court fines and fees disproportionately impact um, low-income people of color at large. Um, and so beyond that, in terms of the actual program's um, implementation, there was a variance in familiarity with the waivers amongst um, the different public defender offices in across the state. So while they were utilized a lot in Cook County, they might not be um, as familiar familiarly um, used in other counties. Um, there were also a lot of technical barriers to the program, um, such as the accessibility of the waiver. So um, oftentimes clerks of court, for example, were hesitant or uh, did not want to provide public defenders with the waivers um, for their clients, which was definitely a barrier. Um, and then also there's a huge amount of uh, varying influence on waiver eligibility um, that comes from judges as well as state attorneys. So um, some judges were enthusiastic to have uh, let the waivers apply for um, certain clients and then others were not so enthusiastic and um, there was a lot of difficulty there. And another problem was in the case of traffic court. So this waiver program did not apply to um, traffic court, which is a huge problem um, and affected so many people um, for um, petty offenses um, that were they were then criminalized even further by having exorbitant fines and fees against them. And so from there, um, we have a variety of small scale and larger scale recommendations. I think we can talk about small scale recommendations such as like um, recommending training programs or um, finding measures to increase accessibility of the waivers. However, I think the real findings from this um, project were that we need to see greater systemic uh, changes to the system that is inherently unjust, that's inherently racist, classist, and oppressive. Um, and contributes to the further marginalization of um, um, black and brown folks um, and to seek um, abolition of the current system and advocate for um, pursuit of, the just, of just alternatives. And um, other students before me spoke about the just city. And I think that definitely um, my urban studies education as a whole has definitely um, led me to pursue that as a, a political framework and something I believe is necessary. Um, so thank you. A really succinct picture of the large and the small, the precise problems and the great structural problems that at the heart of urban institutions. Thank you. Eliza Hicks is next with AS220 Youth's Creation of a Safe Space. Hi everybody, my name is Eliza Hicks and today I'm going to be talking about the creation of a safe space at AS220 Youth. So in my sophomore year I took this class with Professor Josh Pashowitz about urban field work and we were asked to go to any organization and just ask if we could intern with them and conduct interviews and different field work. So I reached out to ASA 20 Youth, which is a free arts program that focuses on youth between the ages of 14 and 21. And they even employ youth to work on art such as graphic art, dance, beat making, visual art, etc. And they focus on youth between that are under the care and custody of the state, like at the Ritz Juvenile Detention Center. Um, and also it's a BIPOC centered and accessible space. So as soon as I walked into the building, I could see this written on the walls, like, why are we here and what do we value? And it was just really clear how much um, this place really values, like empowering the young artists and trying to create catalysts of change and centering social justice um, and really being a place of community for friendship and collaboration. So as soon as I walked in, I just thought like, wow, this is a really awesome space. Um, so, my internship was six months long and I was a social media intern where I created social media content. And I also walked up to them and said like, what is most helpful for you? Um, and they said that a photography exhibit would be really useful just to showcase and celebrate each of the members and also to have quotes and photographs to help promote ASU 20 and to, in order to also get um, grants. So I interviewed 35 students. This, we, these were <laughs> in depth. Um, um, interviews where I took um, verbatim notes and I also interviewed two teachers. So after interviewing all these youth, it was so clear that this is a safe space for them. Um, safe space are spaces that are free from physical threat, judgment, or verbal intimidation. And this was especially a safe space for BIPOC. And um, these are just some quotes that some youth members said in their interviews. No one has ever been mean to me here. They're just chill and accepting. They're not judgmental. It's a space where you can be yourself and not worry about feeling embarrassed. 
this feels like home. So a lot of them have expressed how they didn't feel very comfortable or happy at school or in their homes and how they really enjoyed spending their afternoons here um, and just really felt comfortable with other youth here. It was also especially clear that this was a safe space when I saw their like consent agreement form when students signed up for this program. And it just says, hateration gets no toleration um, and that they don't stand for bigotry or oppression um, and that they're excited to work with youth. So it was just very clear that this was a safe zone for people to be feel comfortable. So it very much was a sense, I also got the sense that this was a home for many youth so one person said it's a home away from home. I'm around people that I enjoy being around. When I go to school, I have to deal with the teacher. I get to make art here with people I like and I feel like I'm at home with my siblings, which is really awesome. Um, and ultimately, I, I think the main takeaway is that this safe space um, really leads to confidence. And confidence, just you really see students and youth signing up to go to open mics. And this is also empowering them to have their own businesses where they sell shirts or they sell their own music and dance. And just these creative outlets really help them to express themselves mentally and also to make money. They're employed and also just help them develop. So somebody said, I saw a vivid shift in confidence before I was doubtful of my work, but now I believe that I'm good. People told me I was good, but I needed to see it for myself. This place has helped me to gain confidence. Art is a way to understand myself, the essence of mental health, a way to express and spread a message. And I was so proud of what I made and I felt like I could accomplish other things. So this was such a lovely space to work in and I have gone back there currently in Costa Rica, but this has inspired me to work as a resident teacher in Providence. And yeah, thank you. Um, so great example of how many of our students are making important connections and doing useful work in the Providence community itself. Ellie Koshik is next with Connecting Community-Based Organizations with Residents, Mapping Toolkits for South Providence, a continuation of the theme. Ellie, go ahead. Hi, I'm Ellie. Um, and for my capstone, I'm gonna be talking about an independent study that I did last year in collaboration with Hannah Wells, who's also in the Urban Studies Department, and Malika Franks and Sivian Chen, who both go to RISD. So this project began in the fall of 2019 with the mission to understand the networks and relationships between community-based organizations and residents in the South Providence community, and I'll be referring to these as CBOs. We wanted to learn how organizations work both with each other and with residents to establish, foster, and serve the needs of the community in a changing economic environment. We chose to study South Providence specifically because it is experiencing significant change and development and also has a high density of CBOs. We began by reaching out to organizations, interviewing and meeting with the community leaders that you can see listed on the left, reviewing case studies from other cities, and mapping out our own observations of the neighborhood. From our observations and conversations with CBOs, a key insight was that some organizations wish they could reach a broader audience, engaging more residents. Based on this insight, we wanted to create a tool to gather a wider range of community input. So we developed an interactive map for public engagement where people could mark certain areas in response to the questions, where do you feel most welcome and happy outside of home? Where within our community do you feel unwelcome or unsafe? And where do you like to go with your friends? These questions were intended to spark conversations within the community. We supplied colored stickers that people could place on the map in response to each question. This map, along with the secondary engagement tool that you can see towards the center of the page, was placed in the entrance of the South Providence Library, which is a community hub. We returned to check on them every few days and took notes of evolving input. After these tools had been in the library for about a month, we reflected on the many responses. The fall semester concluded with a public presentation at the library on our work to date. Based on the helpful feedback from community members and having seen a high degree of engagement with the tool, we realized we wanted to continue to make tools for engagement. In the spring, we aimed to restructure our engagement map as a tool for CBOs. Our two driving goals were to create a self-sustaining tool to be used independently by organizations and to create a mechanism where these tools and results could be shared and modified to fit their ranging missions. Because of COVID, we had to rethink more virtually, but we were able to create three mapping tools that could be used independently. The first tool is a modified version of our original engagement tool that we installed in the South Providence Library. 
It is intended to be used by CBOs for community resident use and is formatted to be easily adaptable and printable. The second tool is intended for internal use by CBOs. Designed to be workshopped in a small group setting, this tool helps CBOs see how their organization fits into the community and with other organizations and services. And the third tool that's meant for residents and organizations alike has more of a planning focus. It allows people to map wants and desires for South Providence. Once the tool has been filled out, the CBO in charge can reflect on the responses and translate them into manageable projects that have the potential to transform the community's future growth. We also designed a fourth reflection tool to encourage organizations to reflect on the engagement tools and to facilitate comprehensive discussions about their future strategies. Used together, these tools have the potential to paint a broader, more inclusive picture of the needs, wants, and concerns of the South Providence community. Most importantly, the tools can all be modified to fit into an organization's of individual uses. In rethinking how a simple map can be used as a tool for problem solving, creative brainstorming, and sparking engagement, these tools intend to strengthen and support organizations and empower residents. The final product of this project was a mapping toolkit for CBOs in a comprehensive report. The toolkit contains the information necessary for organizations to use the tools independently. It includes diagrams and visual examples of the tools, both in construction and in action. It also provides post-engagement questions to facilitate conversations based on responses. This toolkit has been shared with the organizations we connected with, and our hope is for it to reach even more people in South Providence. We also put together a 75-page comprehensive report that covers our process throughout the year, including our research and designs. And I am more than happy to share um, this with anyone who's interested in hearing more about this project. And you can also learn a little bit more about those tools in the Urban Journal, because we have some of uh, an excerpt from that project in the Urban Journal as well, as well as a few of the other capstones you're hearing from today and the theses you're hearing from today. So stay tuned for that. Next up is Jack Nelson with the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, urban praxis as a narrator to American cultural division. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Jack Nelson, and I've used my capstone project as an opportunity to reflect on the status of American culture in the city, using the writings of urban American literature to highlight the ways in which we have come to understand ourselves. This work stems from my time in Professor James Marone's course, American Culture in the City. For those of us who have worked with Professor Marone, we are all well familiar with this understanding of culture as the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. I'll be sharing a brief excerpt of a speech that I've prepared to submit as my capstone project. The American story is one defined by loss. For some, this loss is legitimate and real and worthy of reckoning with. As we've seen in the narratives of white America, there remains one story that intensifies. This is the story of the line, of being pushed back and forgotten as priorities are placed on repairing harmful histories of slavery, discrimination, and hatred. For many white Americans, the urban space has been a haven to escape the loss of privilege. Histories of redlining have curated the urban environment as an aid for socioeconomic stratification. Historically white, wealthy neighborhoods in the city place are known for some of the most expensive real estate, the best primary and secondary schools, and endless access to a life of success and prosperity. Contrastingly, low-income majority black and brown neighborhoods have been forced, at the hand of the fear that privilege may be dispersed of, into a space of precarity and inaccessibility. On the one end, the urban space is a mean to as a means to combat the fear of loss, and on the other, it has been a canvas to intensify that loss. But what do we make of our understanding of America? If America for some has been a constant battle against the fear of loss, and for others, it's been a constant battle against loss, how do we begin to reconcile some, of, some sort of a common identity, a form of a national identity? Perhaps there is no reconciling to a common experience, to a shared faith in the American process as being capable to allow all people, regardless of their identity, to succeed. Yet, we continue to push forward. In many ways, I'm hopeful that we might one day come to understand America as a place that's caused great losses and now stands to repair those broken ties in favor of a more equitable future. But I would be remiss not to acknowledge that nearly all of our social and governmental institutions are built for the purpose of situating black and brown voices in places of precarity. Just as loss cannot be counterbalanced without gain, the idea and experience of American loss cannot be rid of without cultural and institutional repair and replacement. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. We're going to hear more from Jack, too, in a week and a half or so at our senior, uh, senior celebration as Jack is our class speaker. So 
um, where we're going to look forward to more from Jack and particularly those eloquent thoughts about loss in our urban uh, in our urban context. Thanks so much. Next up, we have Tene Nuna, Risk Factors for Renter Housing Instability, a Qualitative Analysis of Renters and Rental Property Owners in Rhode Island. Take it away, Tene. Thank you so much. Um, can you see my slides? We can. Okay, great. Um, all right, so for my capstone project, um, I, I did my capstone project through a thesis I was doing in the School of Public Health. Um, and so what I was looking at is, um, I mean, the goal of my project was to explore risk factors for housing instability among low to middle income renters in the state of Rhode Island uh, through qualitative interviews with renters and rental property owners. So for context, um, over the past 60 years, um, wages have stagnated in the US while the cost of housing has increased exponentially, uh, precipitating experiences of housing instability, uh, which are defined by high housing costs, uh, poor housing quality, unstable neighborhoods, overcrowding, and homelessness. Um, so the core idea behind this project uh, was that housing instability experienced by renters is often perpetuated by the actions of rental property owners um, in, in the ways that they conduct their businesses. Um, so just to quickly go over um, the demographics of my participants. Um, so uh, on this map up to the right, you can see uh, the locations of the renters that I recruited and the locations of the rental property owners of the owners I interviewed. Um, so my sample size for both groups was small. Um, the samples were definitely not representative. Um, so while the findings of my study aren't generalizable to the entire populations of owners and renters in the state, um, the strength of the project was in the in-depth um, in depth findings and uh, discussions with, with both groups. Um, all right, so the results of my, uh, of my project, um, I organized it with a socio-ecological model um, to help conceptualize how uh, both interpersonal level factors and structural level factors um, impact owners' uh, business practices and the experiences of renters uh, per precipitating the experiences of housing stability. So on the renter side of things, um, some of the major findings uh, were that uh, because of the divide between wages and the cost of housing, LMI renters were influenced to avoid asserting their rights uh, to safe, stable housing. Um, and so, I mean, that would, that would um, manifest as um, them not reporting code uh, violations to code enforcement, um, not asking their uh, rental property owners to uh, address issues in their units. Um, and we saw that these sorts of issues were exacerbated by the pandemic uh, due to loss of jobs and lo loss of income, um, uh, expanding the, the, the gap between rents and wages. Um, and then on the owner side of things, um, uh, owners were influenced by structural level factors, both in the market and um, on the regulatory side to increase the cost of their housing. Um, and there were a variety of ways in which owners actually responded to those influences. Um, while most uh, passed on those impacts directly to renters uh, by increasing their rents, um, some owners demonstrated a willingness to use mitigative practices and to avoid causing housing instability among their renters. Um, and just some main takeaways, I won't go into too much depth here because I know I'm over time, um, but code enforcement, um, as we found, uh, was not very accessible to LMI renters. Um, they weren't very effective at protecting renters from experiences of housing instability, um, particularly poor quality housing. Um, so one of the major takeaways is that uh, policymakers should be mindful of the impacts that they put on rental housing businesses 
because rental housing businesses often um, transfer those impacts onto renters. Um, so any sorts of interventions that are taken, um, such as a rental housing licensing program should be balanced in some way with incentives for affordable housing development and preservation. Um, uh, I'll just end right there, but I just wanna say thank you to everyone in the department, um, as well as special thanks to um, uh, Mary Jen Bull. And um, if, if you wanna uh, take a little closer look at my thesis, um, there's a link in a QR code to that. Great, thanks, Tanae. Um, what a great example of getting in between all the actors or many of the actors in this scenario, right? The renters, landlords, and the policy apparatus too. So that's excellent. Thanks for that. Next up, Andrew Olivo, Curating East Berlin, an examination of GDR monuments in post-1989 Berlin and the evolution of Germany's national memory culture. Andrew. Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, all the capstones and theses that have gone this far. Um, for this capstone, I am using a paper I did in uh, Professor Neumann's uh, seminar in Berlin last spring. And so I was really interested in this idea of in the 90s under a unified Germany, um, what the process in Germany, specifically Berlin, was of developing a kind of unified identity and national ethos in this new country, specifically in Berlin, this new city that all of a sudden was reunified. And how would East and West Berliners decide on, you know, what names to put to streets, to civic institutions, to buildings, to monuments. Um, and specifically, I looked at this process of what was the decision-making process behind what to do with East German monuments? Would they be preserved? Would they be removed? Would they be contextualized? Um, and so in 1990, the Active Museum of Fascism and Resistance um, had an exhibition that basically looked at this question and proposed those exact three um, possible outcomes. There could be preservation as these are historical monuments to our past. Um, another option was outright removal that these monuments empowered a defunct regime that was very repressive um, and therefore weren't appropriate for uh, public urban space. And then preserving with context that with proper contextualization, these could be very useful educational monuments. Um, and this debate really came to the forefront in 1990 with um, Tomsky's Lenin statue, which you can see here on the right. It's about 70 feet tall and was in East Berlin. Um, and very quickly in the 90s, uh, in 1990, uh, some West Berlin politicians moved to remove it outright. Um, they thought this big monument to Lenin had no place in Berlin, that um, under the unified Germany, there should be no glorification of um, repressive leaders. Um, and But there was quickly opposition among East Berliners in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, it wasn't even really about protecting Lenin or Lenin's legacy, but it was that this monument was a big piece of their identity and their history. And they felt that a removal of it would be a loss of that East Berlin identity and their culture and their history. Um, but after all, in 1991, uh, the statue was removed rather unilaterally by West Berlin politicians, despite this opposition. Um, and then in 1992, uh, Berlin established this commission for dealing with uh, GDR monuments, which was a group of artists, historians, writers, architects, some politicians, some museum directors. And in 1993, they released a report that actually recommended preservation of most GDR monuments, um, basically saying that East Berliners were entitled to preserving their identity, their history in the built environment, just as much as West Berliners were. And that so long as these monuments were aesthetically appropriate, you know, were they appropriately sized, were they well integrated into urban settings, um, that they could remain, albeit with some proper contextualization. And there were only a handful they wanted to remove or recommended removing, um, basically monuments that they thought were either historically inaccurate or weren't critical depictions of the people they portrayed, um, or if they were just primarily to strengthen the legitimacy of a repressive um, regime. Um, and I chose this as my capstone because I think it grapples with some of the 
on the one hand, some very abstract ideas of national memory culture of how we interact with the built environment and how that reinforces and engages with our identities and the stories we tell about ourselves, as well as there's a very real urban political process here of how democratic was this process? What, in what ways did East Berliners feel represented or not represented in what statues were removed and which were preserved? So thank you. Thank you to everyone in the urban studies department and I look forward to hearing the rest of the capstones. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, a great uh, example of the way that uh, urban issues and national issues intersect and the way these complex and surprising processes make their way into the, into the built environment. Excellent. Next up is Nathaniel Oster, A House Divided, a perspective on the rural urban divide in American culture. Nathaniel. Um, hi, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Um, yeah, so I decided to write my capstone um, just as an excerpt of uh, my final paper for American Culture in the City, which is a seminar I'm taking this semester with Professor Marone, which seeks to uh, explore the role of the city in American culture. So the United States was founded as a primarily rural country. Um, and as a corollary of that, it's sort of founded as an anti-urban country. And we explored a couple of texts that, uh, a couple of founding texts that, that really um, exemplify this idea. So one is the constitution where you can see a, a, a very large um, rural bias um, in two institutions, the Senate and the electoral college, which are very um, biased towards giving political power to rural states. And yet, um, if you look at this graph, the United States has gone from a country that's about 10% urban in the 1790 to around 80% today. So um, the, with this presentation, I sort of wanna explore what lenses we can understand the rural urban divide by and, and how we can think more about that. Um, so here's just another map of the United States sort of showing how the vast majority of the land in the United States um, is so um, rural. Um, and uh, uh, one lens that we can look at that through is uh, race. So um, urban America is very diverse and yet rural America is still very, very white. Another lens we can look at that this through, which is very similar is immigration um, and, and how cities are, are places with lots of immigrants and, and rural places are not. Um, and um, one text that we explored that I think um, really exemplifies this is uh, Dear America, Notes of an Undocumented Citizen by Jose Antonio Vargas, which is a really beautiful book about his experience as an undocumented American. Um, and I, I thought one final lens that, that Vargas sort of um, gives us that, that we can sort of explore is through his income inequality. So here's an excerpt where Vargas is talking about how um, he's sort of accosted by a white man um, for his uh, undocumented status. I think the man had saw him on Fox News and he says, a few seconds after I boarded the plane, I, as I was stowing my luggage, the white man in the oversized black coat grabbed my shoulder as he walked by. I didn't know illegals fly first class, he said. And I don't think Vargas is trying to um, justify anything that this man said, but uh, a few uh, paragraphs later, he mentions that the man had just lost his job. Um, and, um, I think that income inequality is another lens that we can look at the uh, rural urban divide by sort of understanding how, how this divide will, um, will affect the United States in the future. Uh, and one, one way of understanding that I think um, as we're living our lives on Zoom now is, and, and on the internet now is um, looking at internet speeds and, and who has access to the economy in the 21st century. Um, so here's a map of, of states by internet speed, sort of like going back to that original map of um, urban and rural America, looking at where, where people live and, and sort of what counties they live in. Um, so I hope that um, just these different lenses of looking at the United States by um, and this sort of rural urban divide in American culture can sort of give us more of a perspective on how we can um, build equity in the 21st century and, and provide more access. Um, thank you. Thanks, Nathaniel. That's great. A, a very nice summation of one of the most potent and 
hard to hard to uh, parse problems at the heart of our political culture today, right? The rural urban divide and its relationship with race and class. Thank you very much. Mimi Sanford, communities in Providence, Rhode Island, most at risk of experiencing homelessness. So hi, yeah, my name is Mimi. This was the project that I did for Professor Mwanda's GIS class last semester. It was technically in the sociology department, but I uh, we could really tailor our final projects to our interests and I did get permission to use this project. So it is very much about urban studies. Uh, so I'm not actually gonna read homeless. Don't worry, I just wanted to throw up the poster that I did for my final project. Um, I kind of went into this thinking about like kind of, you know, the homelessness epidemic and why like homelessness, you know, happens to people. It's like people don't just become homeless because they're lazy or they lack drive or they make a single bad decision. Most of the time, there are always outside factors in play, things that are outside of people's control, systemic issues, etc. So I went into this project with that mindset and I thought about um, maybe I could map some of these factors because it was a GIS class. So I wanted to map some common risk factors for homelessness. And so basically what I did is I found, um, I went into the census um, data and I found block groups where all of um, my chosen variables in overlapped. I chose four factors that I thought um, covered a wide range of topics um, that were um, risk factors for people who were you know, most at risk of experiencing homelessness. Uh, the four factors were um, households receiving cash assistance, the unemployed population, uh, the population without health insurance, and the disabled population. And so I had two basic research questions. Um, they were, is it possible to ascertain where future direct aid and preventative measures should be concentrated? Because one of the main reasons I did this project was kind of to see where um, resources could be concentrated, um, at least in Providence. And then I also wanted to see that um, if by map mapping known risk factors, could if we could locate which populations are most at risk of experiencing homelessness. And so this was like just um, the final map that I ended up with. Uh, again, I'm not going to go over all of this, uh, like all of how I got here, but um, you can see the area of Providence is overlaid on just kind of a general map. And so essentially I got the census data, like I said, I manipulated it a bit. Um, and I booted out everything that was equal to or lower than the Rhode Island average for all of these factors. So I only focused on kind of what I referred to as the most concerning data. And then I divided that data up into four groups ranging from low to high concern. And then I found um, those bright red areas that are outlined in red are where all four variables overlapped at the highest level of concern. Um, and so that's in Onlyville, Hartford, West End, and Elmwood. And of course, it doesn't mean that the people who live in these areas will become homeless by any means. And it doesn't imply that they live a lower quality of life or anything. These are just my personal suggestions for where relief efforts should be concentrated. Um, that would be things like employment offices, uh, counseling services, more free clinics, uh, places that we should concentrate future affordable housing developments, etc. And it is really important in projects like this, you know, pretty quantitative projects to remember that all of these data points in this map, they represent real people and communities. It's not just the, mum the numbers. And that's why I try to emphasize why this study is so important or why this kind of study, not mine specifically. It's because the idea behind it is to help people. Um, it's to figure out which areas should be receiving the most aid and resources. And so I feel like this project was a really good way of combining like um, kind of the technical, historical and theoretical classes that I've taken. Um, it was a way of kind of categorizing things we learn about in class, like risk factors for homelessness and the affordable housing crisis and adding a visual database component that at least um, that's really one of the ways that I learned best. And so I hope that it um, helps other people learn well as well. And it also let me make maps, which I really enjoy. So thank you, uh, hope you liked my maps and thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Mimi. That's great. Uh, the, the combination of the technical, the theoretical and the historical is a perfect way to sum up what many urban studies students get out of their education. And um, sometimes uh, this great skill in learning how to use GIS to, to map social data on, on the landscape. Uh, so thanks a lot, Mimi. And finally today we have Sherilyn Tan with Sound, Movement and Arts, Building Towards a Just City. 
Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Sherilyn, and thank you so much for all the wonderful presentations. It's been really amazing to hear just all these different approaches to um, urban issues. Um, so my capstone looks at how the arts and specifically sound and movement um, have been mediums that facilitate towards the building of a just city. Um, so thinking about how it's sites of justice, solidarity, healing, um, envisioning possibilities. Um, and I also just want to preface this by saying that I am a point fiver, so um, the capstone that I'm um, kind of framing is also a work in progress and I'm hoping to develop it further and link it to my music concentration as well. Um, so I wanted to provide some context on where I was coming from in this work um, and first off coming in with an interdisciplinary lens um, and as we all know urban studies is pretty um, interdisciplinary and that's part of the reason why I was so drawn to it um, and throughout my time at Brown like the three buckets of work that has emerged um, has been rooted in creative practices how that moved towards social justice um, and how that's been grounded in community and around these different buckets are different modes of knowing and meaning making um, different lens and approaches that I, I draw from. Um, so as I was developing this capstone project, I was drawing a lot upon my own practice in music and arts um, and how that can be a transformative practice. Um, so to give a sense of it, the two aspects that was core to that um, was thinking about improvisation and thinking about experimentation and discovering possibilities within that breaks and what emerges in that. Um, and then thinking about deep listening and active listening. Um, so kind of listening to each other and caring for each other in community. Um, yeah, so to kind of like ground this a little bit more in what I'm thinking about when I'm talking about Just City, um, and we've kind of talked a little bit about that in different capstones as well, so it's really um, wonderful to hear from a couple of you of what um, a Just City means to you. When I think about it, I think about it, how it's tied to the ability to remake ourselves and our cities, so thinking about the agency in that, um, thinking about the ethics of care that Alicia also talked a little bit about um, in her thesis, um, thinking about how that involves our bodies and selves and how we place each um, place that in this interconnected web, um, and thinking about active listening as well, which is something that you know resonates with me with my relationship to music, um, and then thinking about possibility and how that possibility um, is emerged through gathering and crossroads and congregations, um, and this is the case study capstone that I was working on um, in the class Just City with Professor Carter as well. So I'm holding all this in mind um, as I approach my case study and thinking about how we can reimagine and build towards a Just City that holds all these aspects and holds these aspects of justice. Um, so I was really interested in kind of thinking about what about music, sound, movement, arts that's grounded in community that makes it so powerful and transformative in healing and building solidarity. And I'm also thinking about this in the context of everything that's been going on this past year in terms of anti-Black, anti-Asian violence um, and this violence and harm that is systemic um, and intergenerational and deeply felt. Um, so what about sound and movement offers us that possibilities to break out of that? Um, so some of the methods that I looked at um, and used were participatory. So I took part in workshops and talks. Um, I engaged in active listening and conversations um, on transformative justice. I reflected on my own experiences. And then I also wanted to reflect on the kind of histories that this all embodies as well. Um, so I'm going to jump straight to like what I found just because of time. Um, yeah, so in terms of looking at all these different instances and sites of how this was being facilitated and what makes it possible and how this was working in the context of the pandemic as well, um, what I found was that justice really occurs on an internal and relational level as well. And in order to move towards the building of a just city, we had we have to move, we have to begin from the personal underground level with ourselves and the communities around us that again is grounded in care, active listening, intentionality, um, and doing justice to yourself and to the communities around you as well. And what sound and movement um, mix that is so powerful, what sound and movement is so powerful is because it's embodied and sensorial. So thinking about how all these systemic violences and urban violences are also embodied and sensorial is all deeply felt. 
So what sound and movement in arts allows is this spaces of release, of reimagination, um, of reclaiming that, that of what, reclaiming what is possible, um, and allow for these connections to happen between people that kind of pushes this force forwards, um, and allow for this kind of imagination collaboration of what just um, what justice and unjust city looks like. Um, and then another thing that kind of emerged from this is also this idea of an inter space. Um, so we've seen different versions of and approaches to what a just city means. And we're all kind of grappling with, you know, what does that mean? And I've been thinking a lot about where do we meet and how do we meet and reach to each other in this kind of inter disciplinary interconnectedness, um, and then also just kind of holding the intersectionalities that we all hold as well. Um, so it's really crucial to also collaborate across sectors um, and ground this in a kind of like, how, like ground this in a community and um, care that is also interrelational. Um, so this is, yeah. <laughs> um, so what I, I hope my Capstone kind of offers is to be open uh, to arts as also a form of justice and possibility for urban transformation that is central to being able to reimagine what a just city looks like and to build towards that and to take action towards that. Um, and thank you. Great. Thanks, Sherilyn. Intersections, intersectionality, interconnectedness, interdisciplinarity, right? It gives you a, this really gives everyone a great sense of the capaciousness of urban studies and of the work that all of our students have been doing over their time at Brown. We're really grateful uh, as faculty to have so many eager and exciting students working on Come, working on so many different issues and coming at them in so many different ways from the historical to the political, to the social, to the built environment, um, to cultural ideals about uh, and con uh, conflicts over the built environment. So my congratulations to everyone uh, who delivered their capstones and thesis today on, on finishing up your urban studies education at Brown. We really appreciate your all um, sharing with us today and sharing with your families and friends who've been able to join us. Uh, please do drop your thoughts into the chat. Uh, we're all giving rounds of applause that I don't think we can do virtually. We have to do it in this virtual way. Thank you so much. And we really want to uh, give all our, our greatest thanks uh, primarily today to Suzanne Bro, who organized this event, right? Really brought help us to help to, us to bring this event off from behind the scenes and also to our um, supporters in media services who worked with Suzanne uh, to, to make this a success. Um, so I know um, me and Rebecca and the rest of the faculty, I see Bob Azar, I think I saw Dietrich earlier, um, who were able to join us, Dietrich Neumann, yes, Dietrich is there. Um, maybe we could bring it out to the uh, to the full Brady Bunch uh, shot for a second here. Maybe I'm not seeing that. Maybe I'm in speaker and I need to be in gallery. There it is. Okay, great. Um, it's good to see everyone um, here for a minute. And we'll all be back together again, most of us, I think, uh, on uh, what the 28th for senior uh, for our senior celebration. They won't let us call it a graduation. I hope many of all or all of you will be with us for that um, for that celebration, and we'll have. Uh, lots more to say and lots more to, uh, to think about before we all leave each other after this um, trying, but I hope a rewarding year uh, together in urban studies, uh, another year um, succeed, uh, succeeding, I think, in, in doing this work together despite the obstacles. So it's great to see you all. It's always a little awkward to end these Zoom conversations, but um, it's great to see everybody. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing some of you over the next few weeks. Um, anyone who can come to uh, the third and final of our job talks the, on, um, on Monday with Lauren Yap, who's another one of our candidates for the lecture position would be great, even though many of you will not get to benefit from the lecturer who will be with us next year, but anyone who'd love to drop in would be great. Otherwise, we'll see you at the senior presentations. Thanks everybody. And thanks to uh, Media Services and Suzanne. Goodbye everyone, see ya. <laughs>